Let's get started with our next presentation. For those of you who are just joining us, welcome to Novak's Astronomy Day in 2016. Uh, I hope you're enjoying these nice clear skies that we ordered specifically for you. Um, our next speaker will talk to us about uh, dark skies. Uh, this is Laura Greenleaf. She is the volunteer co-leader of the Virginia chapter of the International Dark Sky Association and a certified Virginia master naturalist. Um, she is not an amateur astronomer, so she can help you identify invasive plants, but not the constellations. Uh, that'll be kind of interesting. I mean, we've got plenty of people who can do constellations, but I don't think we've got very many who can do invasive species. So, uh, Sky Meadows was her backyard for most of her life. She grew up on the mountain just to the north of Paris and lived just to the south in the Crooked Run Valley before moving to Richmond in 2007. The loss of a natural night and life under an urban sky ultimately inspired Laura's commitment to light pollution education and advocacy. Since 2012, Laura has delivered about 30 presentations around Virginia and supported the efforts of Virginia IDA uh, and supporters to raise awareness of light pollution, conserve our night skies, and change our lighting practices. She has an eight-year-old son and works part-time as a freelance writer and editor and nonprofit professional. So without further ado, Laura, if you'd like to take, uh, take over. So that's one disclaimer that I'm not, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm out of my element with astronomers, which I think is a little bit unusual for uh, IDA chapter leads, but uh, that is the case. My other, my other um, uh, disclaimer is that I have recently done several presentations. They're always changing. I'm always putting slides in, taking slides out, moving slides around. So if I seem lost at any point, I am. <laughs> so uh, if something pops up and I don't seem to uh, seem a little bit surprised. I'm also not used to working. I'm usually at the controls. So uh, just bear with me if I stumble a little bit. But is everybody here specifically for Astronomy Day, are you going to be here tonight, or did we catch some people who were just at the park today? I'm just curious. Yeah, okay. Also, before I start, I'm going to share, if you please, when I'm done, come up and get some pamphlets and brochures, and I just want to uh, make you aware of a couple of books you may be interested in. Uh, IDA produces this great kind of how-to manual called Fighting Light Pollution, Smart Lighting Solutions for Individuals and Communities. If this is something that you want to personally work on in your own neighborhood or community, I really recommend this. You can get it off of Amazon very inexpensively. If you're particularly interested in the ecological impacts of light pollution, Ecological Consequences of Artificial Night Lighting is a kind of a textbook that you might be interested in picking up, also available online. And then how many of you have read The End of Night? Paul Bogard's The End of Night. You have to get this book, <laughs> give it as presents. It's now in its paperback run. Uh, it's sort of part memoir, part travel log, part pay into the, the night sky. Paul Bogard uh, is now an associate professor of English at JMU. Um, good, I, he's my compatriot. I just did a presentation with him in Rappahannock County a couple weeks ago. It's a wonderful book, so please pick up a copy of that. Okay, I always start out with these two images. And these are two photographs of the same location from 2003, about 45 miles north of Toronto, during a blackout, and then after power was restored. Now, I usually, I start with these images because most people live under a sky like the sky on the right and never experience anything like the sky on the left. You all, as amateur astronomers, you do know what's over your heads. You do appreciate it, and that is a gift. That is something that you definitely want to con continue to share with your children, your grandchildren, your neighbors. That's, that's something that is so important for you to be involved in giving people access to the kind of star, you s the sky you see on the left. Okay, anybody else? <clears throat> You know, we as human beings have this diurnal bias because we are diurnal creatures. We call a day a day, but a day is really a day and a night, right? And yet we call it a day. And the night is something that we've almost tried to banish or eviscerate with our lifestyle and our lighting. But we need to start questioning what we're losing when we lose the night. And I believe that we've ruptured our most fundamental connection to the natural world, that the night, the 24 cycle, 24-hour cycle of night and day is the primary evolutionary cue. We evolved 
with night. And yet it's only been in less than a century that we have obliterated the night. What, what cost is this to us? Okay. That was a common nightly human experience up until 50, 60 or so years ago for most of us. Human beings throughout our history encountered, had a face-to-face -face encounter with the universe every night. And this inspired religion, philosophy, science, certainly humility, which we as a race can use, uh, as, a, as a species can use, um, awe, and it was how we understood our place in the universe, and it was how we found our way here on Earth by navigating, certainly beginning on the seas. My, I was raised by my father as a pilot. He's 83 years old. He first started flying in the early 1950s, and he learned to navigate by the stars, and something that most people cannot possibly relate to anymore. And that the, the loss uh, to science of light pollution is what originally inspired the creation of the International Dark Sky Association. It was started by astronomers back in 1988. And uh, it has since then been, is always the recognized authority on light pollution worldwide. It's the leading organization combating light pollution. And the scope of work for IDA is many things. It's public policy, it's education and outreach. We have a fixture seal of approval program, sea turtle conservation. But our flagship award-winning program is the Dark Sky Places program. And places like Sky Meadows are very much, this not, it's not yet for Sky Meadows, but places like Sky Meadows are very much a part of that. We have certified 14 communities, three developments of distinction, 31 parks, two sanctuaries, and 10 reserves. Most of the parks are in the United States. And who can tell me what was certified Dark Sky Park number 25 last year? Anybody know? I don't know. No, not yet. Yes, Sky Park. Getting closer, Stanton River State Park, yes, in Virginia. Virginia is home to Dark Sky Park number 25. We only have one in Virginia, but it was only the fourth on the East Coast. Very special. And since then, and I, I just want to give credit to Adam Lehman, the park manager there, who was instrumental, and he has really become a Dark Sky ambassador uh, since that time. It was an incredible partnership between an astronomy club, specifically the Chapel Hill Astronomical Observation Society, who like to go by the name Chaos, and Adam Lehman, and the communities surrounding, which is, uh, um, it's in Scottsburg, Virginia. So people hear Stanton, they think it's out in Augusta County, but it's Southside, Virginia. And since that time, there has just been this incredible wave of momentum in Virginia, interest in uh, dark sky conservation. We had a young woman here earlier today, Laura Callahan, remarkable high school student who was leading an effort at James River State Park to become a certified dark sky park. They are ready to apply at this point. Uh, but you know, part of our dark sky place program is to recognize that we just can't sort of turn the skies into a museum that a few people have, ac have access to. We have to recognize what we have, where we have it, protect what we have, and roll back light pollution, and in fact, there's a dark sky reserve in Canada that I'm not gonna bother trying to pronounce because I know I mispronounce it, it's a French name, where they have actually successfully brought light pollution levels back to 1970s levels. I'm sure you've seen images like this from the International um, Space Station. That is the East Coast from Norfolk all the way up Interstate 95 to Long Island. And you know, we use images like this, we see them so frequently, and it's almost a, um, a prideful thing. It's a kind of like, look at us, you know, this is what we've done. Uh, it's used as a marker for progress, sometimes even for democracy, if you think about the images of North and South Korea. But all this really is, it's not, this is not about looking at a, the use of electric light or electricity. This is just waste, this is light that is dumped out into the sky. It's waste made visible. Okay. And there are impacts to this, certainly to science. I saw somebody earlier who had a Greenwich Observatory 
shirt on and I was just reading that I think last just earlier this week it was um, I can't remember what day it was in 1675 that King Charles um, he you know he ordained or whatever the observatory is the you know the center of of time and space and then of course by the 20th century it was decommissioned because of light pollution and again that has an impact to science which you understand we waste a tremendous, tremendous amount of energy on light pollution. There are ecological consequences to light pollution that resonate throughout the food web. It impacts our safety. Our poor use of lighting does not enhance our safety. It reduces it. It impacts our health. And too often, we don't recognize how instrumental lighting is in the communities that we create. Lighting doesn't just happen on its own, it all comes back to us. It's how we choose to use lighting. And light pollution comes from lighting that is completely unnecessary, poorly located or aimed in a wasteful way, that's either not full cut off, which I'll talk about later, or unshielded, just too bright or too blue. And we'll talk about what that means as well. In other words, it's just lighting that's excessive and wasteful, it's lighting overkill. And this is what it's done to us in just about 60 years. This is the Atlas of Artificial Night Sky Brightness, which is the creation of Italian astronomers. What they did is they, I think this was created in 1997 originally, and they extrapolated backwards to the late 1950s of what light pollution was then in the middle 70s. The, the point in time of 1997, and then they projected forward to 2025 if light pollution continues to increase at the rate, the annual rate that it has continued to increase. And I grew up in this area, uh, we moved to the mountain just north of here in 1975, and I remember the night skies of my childhood, and I can tell you that they had been severely eroded by light pollution from the Shenandoah Valley, from basically from Front Royal to Martinsburg. I have s just seen this in my own lifetime. So this is where we're headed if we don't turn it around. Okay. And I don't need to ask you all if you, I usually say, does anybody know what this, does anybody know what Bortle's scale is? Of course you all know what Bortle's scale is. I don't need to explain that to you, but I, when I'm talking to sort of a general public audience, I use this to point out that when we look at those images from space, it looks like there are dark places. But of course you know that light pollution is not contained within borders, that it spreads and it bleeds out, and that it's visible as much as 250 miles away. So there are no truly pristine, dark places in Virginia or West Virginia. The darkest skies I've ever been under are in the Allegheny Highlands because we now uh, go out to Highland. Has anybody, does anybody here go to Highland County? Familiar with Highland County? I go, <laughs> definitely a place that you wanna visit. Um, I would encourage you to do that, okay? Yes. I-81, Roanoke, yeah, and you know, it's, right. I don't know, I don't know what the sources may be, I don't know what the uses are down there, except that, yeah, every, pl even, even small towns, even, you know, there's just so much bad lighting everywhere, so I don't know what the specific, like, point sources. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> right. And things have also, again, rapidly, rapidly changed. And this is what it's, this is a representation of Bortles from the sort of the human scale, the sort of going, going, gone effect. And I think a lot of people feel like, I certainly felt like when I lived on Pleasant Vale Road, just south of here, that I was under incredibly dark, starry skies. It's one of my final memories, you know, this thing that I remember looking up at the sky that summer nine years ago when I right before I moved to Richmond just just devastated knowing I was going to lose that sky but I wasn't living under a pristinely dark sky I was actually probably you know in a it might be a f maybe it's a four down there I don't know but now I'm under a seven eight sky and so this is it's this is something that happens slowly enough that people don't realize it's going. Um, and then once you're younger than a certain age, you've never experienced this unless you're lucky enough to travel somewhere. Okay. 
All right. That should hopefully. <laughs> wrong wrong uh, lunar phase for you. Okay, so what we've been talking about with Bortles, with that representation, is one manifestation of light pollution. What most people, I think, think of when they hear light pollution is sky glow, right? The light uh, reflecting and refracting off of uh, moisture and particles in the atmosphere, washing out the stars. But there is also glare that, you know, this is something that's impacting everyone, whether they care about a starry sky or not. Light clutter, when there's just such a haphazard and sort of thoughtless array of lights that it becomes distracting. And light trespass, <coughs> light shining in or on to places it's not intended, people's private property, into homes. So these are the two things that I hear about the most, that we get sort of what I call SOS calls, you know, emails to Virginia IDA, are not necessarily from stargazers or astronomers. They're from people coping with these impacts from either municipal lighting, commercial lighting, or neighbor's lighting. Yeah. Uh, so they're intentionally trying to add the safety because it has so much glare. You actually couldn't see a pedestrian trying to cross in your own direction. Uh, so that's, uh, yeah, those are the two reasons. Yeah. Go ahead and dance. The other thing is, you know, you think of these being issues that only impact suburbs and cities, but increasingly you cannot get away <laughs> from light pollution in the country. This is Harrisonburg, by the way. So this is, and this is a view of the Shenandoah Valley. Okay. And a little personal experience, uh, several years ago, my family and I drove down to Giles County on the edge of the Jefferson National Forest, and that light, which is one of these, which is the style that, there's a couple of them here in the Sky Meadows property, that light was shining out, shining, uh, lighting up our cabin. Uh, there were also floodlights on, on adjoining cabins, uh, so it's, it's ever present pretty much wherever you go now. This, is, this was an SOS call. This is a church in Louisa County. Louisa is sort of in between Richmond and Charlottesville. There's an older couple who moved back to the wife's childhood home. This is a beautiful bucolic area. It'd be great for stargazing, big open field. This church put incredibly high-powered LED, quote-unquote, security lights on the, on the edge of the roof line, all of them shining out, creating light trespass hundreds and hundreds of feet away, incredible glare, and they cannot resolve this with the church. They will not, they refuse to back away from the sliding. So again, this is very much a rural issue as much as it is an, a, a suburban or urban issue. I, IDA is not opposed to outdoor lighting. You know, very often if you, when you get people sort of an, trying to antagonize you, they'll say, oh, you know, what do you want to do? Go back to lanterns and candlelight? No, well, sometimes, but generally no. Uh, IDA supports quality lighting, responsible, thoughtfully used lighting. And when we do that, we're using lighting in a way that takes into, consider, into consideration visibility, real safety, not just the feeling of safety, but real safety, our comfort, there's, you know, bad lighting tends to not really be something you want to be around. The character of our communities, the aesthetics of our neighborhoods, our human health and our environmental health, and again, property and privacy. Because light trespass, I really do regard that as a, uh, as a property rights violation. People can light their own property. They don't have a right to light up the inside of your home. When we boil that down to a few simple principles, we can encapsulate them by saying that we want to use just the light we need, where we need it, and when we need it. And that you, you should see the light, but not the source of the light. So for instance, if you're looking at these right here, there are shields over those bulbs, right? So you're not seeing the source of the light. And if it were nighttime, you would, however, see the illumination coming from the lights shining on the top of the tent. So that's what we're talking about. You want illumination, but not the direct exposure to the source. Then can you click again? And I would make that even more simple by saying less is more, that we just have this attitude that if a little light is good, then a more must be really great. And so we just, overdo it. But when it comes to lighting, very often less lighting is actually more effective and productive. 
not only we, the very first principle, the first thing we should ever be asking about lighting in a given location or purpose is, do we light at all or do we not light? And before that, do we need overhead lighting? We tend to default to overhead lighting, you know, putting up parking lot style lighting or roadway lighting in places we don't need it. We should always be considering the potential of what I call wayfinding lighting, where you have very low illumination levels and your lighting is literally located close to the ground. These are all excellent examples of how you do that. I want you to pay attention to that light right there when we go to the next slide. So that light I pointed out to you is actually a parking lot, Gesundheit, a parking lot light um, at a restaurant in Goochland County, which is a rural county west of Richmond. And this is that restaurant. And look at how they've used lighting to create atmosphere, to respect the environment. This is a play, you know, this is this is in the country. You're getting out of the city and you're going to this nice restaurant, but that, that parking lot back there behind the sign is lit by those those little lights that are basically at this level. They are doing some uplighting with trees. You know, very subtle, but does the job, does what you need to do, and also protects your vision, which we'll get to in a minute. Okay, go ahead and advance. These are the kind of lights you don't want. They all commit the same crime of showing you the light, the source, instead of just the illumination. They're all exposing the source of light so that you're looking directly at the lamp, or, or the bulb is the kind of vernacular term. Okay. These are alternatives to all of them involving shielding of wall packs or a full cutoff wall pack. This is the NEMA light with a shield on it. Again, there's no excuse for bad lighting. You really open up options and open up possibilities when you use lighting more, more responsibly. I tend to get kind of periodically, I get like a, a least favorite light thing going. And right now it's the acorn. I am so sick of acorn <laughs> street lights. They are my, uh, my top, you know, least wanted right now. This is Front Royal on the top, that's Main Street. And this is Winchester, which has absolute, these are both Winchester, the downtown mall. They are the biggest, <laughs> worst. They, it's like they deliberately set out to do the worst thing they could possibly do with their lighting. Um, somehow, somewhere along the way, this became the go-to light for period style lighting, for historical, Accurate, I don't know what, but the thing is, they're hearkening back to a style of light from the 1920s, but they're putting like 10 to 50 times as much light into that globe than was used at the time. This, this is just a mistake. So whatever you do, don't let this happen <laughs> in your neighborhood or community. If you have to throw yourself in front of <laughs> the light, <laughs> don't let it happen. Well, if it's already happened, that's a whole, I don't even want to go down that path right now. I mean, they can be retrofitted with ba internal baffles. They can be sort of less bad, or you could go to like less intense light or warmer light. Uh, but yeah, that's a tough, that's, that's tough. But let's go to the next slide. These are alternatives. So if, you're if someone's talking about doing a Main Street revitalization project or whatever, and they start talking about period style lights, this is the way to go. These are, like, those are two lantern-style lights. They're, the lighting, this is a pendant-style light. This is actually from a dark sky community in Florida. So you can have period-style light. Middleburg is about to install uh, new street lights um, that look like they're going to be pretty good. I mean, we'll see how it actually plays out in practice, but they are lantern-style lights. They are not acorn lights. All right, so what the acorn does, the acorn is over on the left, the non-full cutoff light, blasting light in all directions, wasting the majority of it. When we talk about full cutoff lighting, and this, this jargon is still sort of layperson jargon for lighting, there is actually a more complex classification system now that the Illuminating Engineering Society of North America uses, but this is still pretty um, useful language to use. When you're using full cutoff lighting, you are not emitting any light below a 90 degree horizontal line passing through the upper portion of the fixture. So, you know, your, your bulb or your lamp is recessed in the top of that fixture. It is not dropped below the fixture and the light is simply shining down. 
And does it make a difference? Well, this is a really poor quality um, images, but they're real. This is a shopping center in Connecticut, and on the top is the before picture, and on the bottom is the after picture when they were coming into compliance with an uh, outdoor lighting ordinance that required full cutoff lighting. So full cut, this transfers better and sometimes in other settings, but puts lighting on the ground, eliminates or minimizes glare and uplight. Okay. Now, there are a number of organizations that care about light pollution that might surprise you, and one of them is the American Medical Association. And in 2009, the American Medical Association did pass resolutions urging uh, action on light pollution. Why would they do this? Well, one reason is that our eyes, like our ears, have a dual Role. You know, our, our ears, obviously, we hear with them, but they also give us balance. And our eyes have this non-visual role because they have photoreceptors in the back of the retina um, that, uh, let's see, that, whoops, got ahead of me. That's okay, you can go ahead. So, so those photoreceptors receive light, which there are messages encoded in that light that, that, uh, that the brain translates and that light dark cycle is responsible for cueing our body clock, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the body clock that regulates all of these bodily functions, heart rate, temperature, obviously sleep, alertness and performance, hormone production, and perhaps what's become, what people are getting more most familiar with is the role in melatonin suppression. So darkness is the cue uh, for melatonin production, but light suppresses melatonin. And there's been research over the past at least couple of decades that's showing a relationship between melatonin suppression and the growth of uh, certain cancerous tumors, certain hormone-related cancerous tumors. So it's a, it's a correlation, it's not a causal relationship, but there's a lot of research going into that that um, I guess you could say it hasn't been proven, but it hasn't been disproven, and it's, it's continuing uh, to be worked on. And then glare is the other reason the AMA uh, passed these resolutions, because they recognized that glare is a tremendous safety problem. They particularly singled out older people in this. So this is a particular hazard to older drivers. Roadside glare from too bright, poorly designed lighting is creating a safety hazard. Well, why is that? It's because a good visibility depends not on the brightest possible light. Good visibility allows our vision to function, and our vision depends on the ability to see contrast and to adapt to varying light levels as you move through darkness, dim light, some amount of light back into darker lighting. But what glare does to us, it forces the iris to contract. It basically disables the rods that if we remember from our, you know, junior high or high school biology class are responsible for our night vision. And then as we age, the lens of our eyes develop imperfections like cataracts, for instance, which bright light tends to scatter off of and create kind of a whiteout effect. So all of these things together mean that glaring bright light is not something that, uh, that, that actually enhances visibility. It tends to reduce visibility. And color of light really comes into play in both these things. I mean, who among you is aware that as you're increasingly seeing very white or blue light, that it seems more glaring, more uncomfortable? Yeah, with cheap, cheap, low quality LED lighting is what we're seeing. So uh, our eyes are particularly sensitive to blue, white light. And by that, this is, um, this is where energy is distributed uh, along the color spectrum. So down here in this 20, and it's, it's called color correlated temperature. You can just think of it as the color of light. Color correlated temperature is measured in Kelvin. So when you're looking at a light bulb, you wanna pay attention to the number on it. And this is, what, this is uh, your kind of sweet spot for lighting. It's the color of a standard incandescent bulb, which have obviously passed out of use, but 2,700 Kelvin. The International Dark Sky Association has set a standard of 3,000 Kelvin for their fixture seal of approval program. 
and for their guidelines on LED lighting. So that 2,700, 3,000 Kelvin is where you want to be for good lighting. And then oddly enough, we have blue light sensitive photoreceptors. So blue light is particularly efficient at suppressing melatonin. So there are two impacts here. Not only is it worse for vision, it's also worse for, um, that's funny, I thought I moved a slide before that one. Hmm, I think I used a different flash drive. Okay, we'll just go with it, but anyway. And on the note uh, of vision and visibility, this is where safety comes into play, and this is where um, our ideas about lighting and security and safety come into play because we are a we are mostly afraid of the dark uh, and the more we get dependent and accustomed to pervasive over lighting the more afraid the more uncomfortable uncomfortable we are in dimmer lighting but the interesting thing is that like the ma ama the organization crime prevention through environmental design also recommends that lighting systems minimize glare, shadow, light pollution, and light trespass. And this is one of the reasons they uh, realize that this is that bad lighting is not safe lighting. Is someone there? Do you see a person? Does anybody see a person? We see a big glaring se security light on the wall, but if you blot out that big glaring light, you realize that there is somebody standing there in the doorway that you couldn't see because that harsh glare creates this contrast that, you know. Well, right, but it's actually literally creating this dark shadow that conceals um, individuals that can be a nice handy hiding spot. And there's another example. Okay, so we have some big, tall overhead lights. We see the person in the crosswalk, and now the person is gone, or, or is the person gone? Is the person still in the picture? He's standing right here. But again, this very, very bright, poorly designed light has created this dark spot under the light that's completely concealing someone. So this is, this, is not, this is not a condition that creates a safe environment. And the other surprising thing about crime, and I, you know, I always address this in my presentations because it's the thing that people, it's an issue that people raise, but what about our safety? What about security? We need lighting to be safe. And there's so much overnight lighting, right? There's so much dusk to dawn lighting, but here we're talking about Richmond. And in 2013, a local paper compiled all the data on crime for the year for 2013, from the most innocuous crimes to the, the very worst, most violent crimes. And where do you see the spikes? It starts at midnight, kind of, yeah, there's a spike. But then look, the lowest levels of crime occur in those overnight hours, and they start to pick up in the morning and they actually jump up at noon and at five and six and seven, the, sort of the late afternoon, early evening. That's actually when crime is spiking. Okay. And in fact, let me just add to that, the FBI statistics match up with this, with this pretty, um, pretty well also. Think about residential lighting. People use residential lighting to prevent break-ins, right? I'm assuming that's what, what people are trying to achieve with that. Most, the majority of residential break-ins occur during the day because the key factor in a residential break-in most of the time is the absence of anyone. They don't want to break in when people are there. They want to break in when the house is empty and that's more likely going to be during the day. So about 60% of residential break-ins at least are actually occurring during daylight hours. Uh, there is zero evidence that lighting on its own as a standalone measure uh, prevents or deters crime. In 1997, the Department of Justice reported to Congress that they had analyzed all that was available about lighting and crime, and they basically said, you know, sometimes it can help, sometimes it doesn't, and sometimes it can actually be counterproductive. And circumstances in which lighting can be counterproductive include 
when criminals are actually able to use lighting to detect potential targets, whether that's property crime or victims, and just to sort of assess assess their surroundings. So particularly with, if you think about, uh, you know, um, a home in the middle of the night, nobody's around, right? Criminals need lighting too to see what they're doing and to gain access. So lighting can, in certain circumstances, actually sort of aid and abet uh, criminal activity. What they've also found is that lighting, if lighting has potential to deter crime, it requires the presence of witnesses. So in deserted areas or remote isolated areas, it's, it's very unlikely uh, to be effective. The other problem is that if you've got bright glaring security lights that neighbors that are so problematic that neighbors are closing their blinds, you've just lost you know, one of your best defenses, which is the sort of neighborhood watch effect. So, and there's been other uh, research, interestingly, several years ago in Chicago, Chicago Police Department did one of the better analyses uh, of lighting and crime because they 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 did a um, a pre they did an alley lighting project where they increased lighting significantly light levels but they did do a control group which is unusual in these in these situations and they did do pre and post uh, data collection on crime. And in the six month period after the installation of this much more and brighter lighting, reports of crime, all crime, including violent crime, went up significantly in those lit areas. That doesn't necessarily mean that crime itself went up in those areas, but the reports of daylight, reports of daylight crime went down and reports of nighttime crime actually increased. So that's a, that's a really, ambiguous picture. I think that we can, you know, they could certainly conclude from that that the lighting did not reduce crime. So, we'll move on from that. It didn't reduce crime, but it, it displaced it crime, potentially. Meaning that people were observing it? Yeah. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, but they did not draw that conclusion. There was no way, because it, as they compared it to the control group, they did not come to the conclusion that they were simply a, that there was simply an increased observation of crime. It was a really significant jump, statistically significant jump. Okay, so we talked about the biological and visual impact of bad lighting on humans. Well, we're part of the natural world, no matter how we try to separate ourselves from it. And in fact, there is tremendous ecological impact from artificial light at night. No, I did, yes, I have a whole different presentation than I thought I had, so things are not popping up where I thought they were. But as a master naturalist, I often talk to other master naturalists who really care a great deal about the kind of habitat they're creating at their, on their home property. And the standard things we teach people about habitat is that you have to provide food, you have to provide water, cover, and safe places for animals to raise their young. But I would add to that that we need uh, to ensure that they have a natural day night cycle. Go ahead. Why is that? 60% uh, of invertebrates and 30% of vertebrates are nocturnal. But light at night can also be disruptive to diurnal and crepuscular creatures, crepuscular meaning active at dusk and dawn. And it can interfere with all of their life cycle activities, all of their behavior and their physiological processes, navigation, migration in particular, orientation pr can disrupt predator-prey relationships, foraging, the ability to find food, mating. Uh, one example of that would be that frogs have been, they've observed that frogs reduce their calling in lit areas and calling is instrumental in mating. Their development and certainly their mortality, whether you're talking about um, Animals, again, disabled in the orientation sense with their light night vision not functioning and getting, say, hit by cars, or the uh, high, uh, more insect mortality with outdoor lighting, which then reduces a food source. How do these things happen? There's a number of different ways. One, it disrupts their perception of day length, which we call photoperiod. It has the same impact on their dark adapted visual systems as it does on ours. And of course, for nocturnal animals, they have evolved to be in dim and dark conditions or, or a night lit only by the moon and stars. 
impacts their circadian rhythms as well. There's the disruption of the celestial compass by which uh, many animals, um, just an incredibly mysterious thing, but navigate and migrate. And phototaxis, which is that either it can be positive or negative, meaning attraction to night, to light, a source of light or a repulsion from light. So when I'm talking to master naturalists, I go into this a whole lot more. But if it's something you're interested in, I again recommend that particular uh, uh, textbook. And there's lots of information to be found online. And not only does it affect animals, it affects plants, um, particularly woody trees and shrubs. And this really depends very much on uh, the species of of uh, trees and woody shrubs. Some are more sensitive than others, and it depends on the spectrum of light and how bright it is and how long they're exposed. But it does, light at night does have the potential to, again, artificially extend the day or the photo period, which then impacts uh, the plant's growth, leaf drop um, in the fall when days should be getting, right, or shorter, and their dormancy. And in, in, by impacting dormancy, it can impact survival. So what can you do as uh, just a homeowner in your neighborhood or encourage your neighbors to do? How do you, what do you do to make your lighting better? Very simple. We go back to those principles, you know, right? Less is more. See the light, not the source. Light only what you need, where you need it, when you need it. Just aim lights down. Light should never be aimed outward. You can just reduce the intensity of light. Look at the bulbs in your porch light or whatever. And if you have a 100-watt bulb, maybe you only need a 60-watt bulb. Maybe you only need a, or equivalency, 40-watt bulb. Shield them. If these floodlights that are so just ubiquitous, uh, there's a product called Par Shields, which just fits right on them and makes a huge, huge difference. Use light sensors, infrared or motion sensors, rather than all-night lighting or just change out your fixture to something that's a full cutoff or shielded fixture. And then stick with that 3,000 Kelvin rule that you want that warmer, warmer light end of the spectrum, not the glaring blue-white light. There are resources for you, including IDA's Fixture Seal of Approval program, and they have just recently totally redone their, uh, their website and their database, so it's much more user-friendly. The PAR shields you can find online. They're about $25 for a pair. They come in white or bronze <laughs> finish. Um, Lowe's, a few years ago, partnered with IDA to create a good neighbor lighting program. So they actually have their own line of good neighbor lighting. And this is a website that is also out there called Starry Night Lights. And I, you know, some of this lighting is pretty expensive, to be honest. I mean, some of these fixtures, some not so much. But I've seen some really creative uh, ideas too, where people just are just so, you know, DIY skilled that they kind of create their own shield. So there's a lot of options. And that's it. I think we have. Looks like I'm wrapping up right on time. So we have time for a few questions. The gentleman in the back, one or the other. <laughs> That would be great. I would love that, but we're not we're not there yet. But that would be to to you know where you're seeing it is a like lead certification. You get with lead certification there are points for exterior lighting. I think it's filtering in that way, but it hasn't. Hopefully that would be really great. But there, the other thing is there's you know what is it what do we mean when we say green lighting or dark sky friendly lighting? Because people like to bandy that phrase about and it. No. May not so only IDA really IDA's fixture seal of approval is the only kind of quality assurance that you can get. So regarding, regarding the three thousand degrees. The three thousand Kelvin. Uh -huh. Yeah. So there have been a number of recent, and I would, a really great website to check out, Bob Parks, 
who um, some of you probably know. He's a member of Novak. He lives in Northern Virginia. He's the former executive director of IDA, and he's now the executive director of the Smart Outdoor Lighting Alliance, SOLA, Smart Outdoor Lighting Alliance. He has a nice list of case studies on his website of street lighting projects in different places in the country. And there have been some very hard lessons learned uh, with putting in bad LED lighting. Uh, and one example is that turned it around is San Jose, it's not, uh, not, uh, Davis, sorry, Davis, California. They were doing a street light conversion and people just pitched a fit. They rebelled against the street lights, they complained and Davis just halted the project in the middle of it. They just stopped um, and they went through this whole process of getting public input. They were going to the high, Cal I think that was like 4,000 Kelvin. They sought public opinion and they actually went back, started all over again and installed, changed the lights to 3,000 Kelvin at a lower intensity. So they, they ended up, of course, spending money going back and redoing what they had done, but ultimately the warmer lighting, the 3,000 Kelvin at the lower level was going to be much less expensive than what the supposedly high efficiency lighting before. Another, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts is doing a street light conversion and they're, they're really being up, held up as a role model because they are taking advantage of adaptive control, which is one of the great features of LED lighting, this capacity to control it remotely turn it on and off, have curfews, dim it, change the lighting levels during higher levels of activity and then going to a lower level or turning off overnight. They're actually doing that. So yeah, there has been some really bad street lighting projects, but hopefully localities will start learning from their predecessors. Mm -hmm. Really, right. Sign all their lights and their stuff right. When business is over, yeah. You know, interestingly, uh, Fairfax County has, you know, there are about 20 outdoor lighting ordinances in Virginia. They're not necessarily effective, and that's kind of a whole separate topic. But Fairfax's outdoor lighting ordinance requires 50% cutting lighting 50% overnight after close of business. Now, it's probably not enforced. I have no idea how much that's used. But I do have a, I don't have it in this presentation, but I do have a slide of a, car dealership um, with its lighting cut, like half the lights are off and the other half are dimmed or something like that. So yes, I mean that's a wonderful solution. We light up parking lots, empty parking lots all night long. Like if we could just fix that, it would make such a difference. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you know, that's something, if you live in Fairfax County, get familiar with your outdoor lighting ordinance. Sure. 